Hello, I'm Lux. And I'm Ember. And this is our thoughts on Little Witch Academia and the Enchanted Parade. It took us forever to get to the sequel. And I have no idea when we're going to get to the series. But I certainly enjoyed the movie. Not as much as the first one, but I did. The first one was a little more fun. This, well, not that almost everything isn't formulaic, but this felt a little more formulaic. Would you like to go over the points of the formula? Oh, well, let's see. Delinquent students, one last chance, trying to upgrade an old tradition, dealing with stereotypes, and the whole playing it up so that the audience doesn't realize they're actually in danger. That's a classic. At least it's not the setup of, like, no one tells the audience that's watching that this is just an act. People just assume that it's part of the show. This is when we actually had someone instigating the fact that this is all part of the show. Which I know has been before, but next, uh, here comes the climax. <laughs> <laughs> Though, um, I do like how they handle a couple of things, and I like a couple of the new characters they introduced. The techno geek kind of magician, which I should say. And the girl with the red and yellow hair. The uh, thief slash acrobat slash pole dancer. I love how you tossed that in there. I've taken classes. It's exactly like that. Yeah, that was quite acrobatic. I always imagined stuff like that with modern witches and brooms or modern wizards and brooms. Like when I saw Harry Potter, I'm like, there's got to be people in that universe who do trick broom flying. Because that should totally be a thing. And it would look so cool. I mean, you're on this thin stick up in the sky, flying around at high speeds, barely holding on, doing tricks would be really cool. Yeah, it's like extreme tightrope walking because the rope is a broom and it moves. Yeah. And she was just so cool. And I'm like, really, that's basic stuff. That's not basic stuff, lady. <laughs> no, no, that's pretty basic. If it's basic, anyone can learn it relatively quickly. I don't think anyone there except for the one lady, which I can't remember the name of, Diana, except for Diana, who could probably learn it quickly. But the moves were at least trackable because the Techno Geek Witch programmed her robot to do the moves. I also love that her little robot can turn into a machine gun. It falls under the rule of Ruby. It's also a gun. <laughs> It also makes me wonder if all their magic use around the giant was the first kicker, and then the fact that the soil was disturbed by the mayor set it off. Possible, because they were using their magic right there, and Miss Ursula did say that the shiny rod magic kind of finished setting it off. Also, it seems to act as a giant battery, which is kind of hinted at in the first movie, but it now radiates that energy to nearby magical objects that need it. So it kind of in itself acts as a philosopher's stone, I think they called the thing in the tower. But then you have to wonder if the magic disturbs the giant. Okay, that was random magic and just the presence of the shiny rod. But we see in the footage from the prior parade that they finish it with doing a ceremony at that location, which uses magic. I'm thinking the ceremony itself is meant to re-up the seal on the giant. I think so too. So I'm saying, so controlled magic keeps it asleep, but a random magic not directed towards it wakes it up? Maybe. Or maybe it's a combination of being disturbed and magic and stuff like that. It's kind of hard to tell. Stuff like that was kind of like left up in the air. So what were some of your favorite parts? And I noticed that you were also like, ugh. Why do they keep her in the school? Yeah, seriously. This is another one of those tropes of having the person who doesn't know that much ending up being the one with the special weapon or being a star student. Okay, Harry Potter grew up in the muggle world and he's like a star Quidditch player and the chosen one. And like every RPG ever, you leave town and you come back and it's destroyed and you find out that your past isn't what you think it is. There's even this great comic about that where a guy looks totally different than everyone in the village. And the mom's like, no, you're not different at all, son. I know I'm different, mom. Go out to the forest and get the firework. No, mom, I know if I leave, the village is going to be destroyed when I come back. And you're going to tell me up from another, no, dear, it's okay. Go to the forest, gather some wood. <sighs> okay, mom. Comes back, I knew it. 
The village is in flames. Mom's reaching up going, I have to tell you something about your past. You're not rich. I've been saying that for the past 15 years, Mom. <laughs> uh. But Aiko doesn't know what she's doing. She doesn't really learn her idol is Shiny Chariot, who apparently nobody else likes. So basically, she's only in the school because Shiny Chariot can see that she can use her old magic MacGuffin. And apparently it's a powerful magical MacGuffin that people actually do semi-respect, but they don't respect that she used most of her magic to show off to the world in their perspective. But who knows if she was actually showing off? Maybe she was actually trying to attract more young people to become witches because maybe it was dwindling then and she actually brought people in. Or maybe she was trying to, you know, inspire that sense of wonder that so often we lose it after childhood. Hmm, don't know. But obviously Shiny Chariot did something wrong because the magical MacGuffin stopped working for her. Though that may just be a plot device. Yeah, or she decided not to use it anymore because something bad happened in her past that she doesn't feel worthy of it anymore. I still hold to the theory that Mrs. Ursula is Shiny Chariot, and I stand by that. I hold to that theory as well, because I'm pretty sure she was Shiny Chariot, and I'm thinking it's something in her past that made her, like... But in the first movie, she specifically talks about the Shiny Rod responding and saying that it hasn't lit up in X number of years. Hmm. Meaning she probably somehow lost the ability to wield it, but we know she can still use magic because she's at the school using magic. As a teacher. Though I think there was something in that movie where she, um, another clue that she was shining chariot, like something about her hair or something changed when she was near the rod or something. Also, I'd like to point out that crossbows don't work like that. I don't know if it was really a crossbow. It was more like a very giant bow, though she did call it a ballista, which is... But they also use the word crossbow. They specifically use the word crossbow when talking about the weapon. And then the attack had the word ballista in it. Hmm. I didn't catch the um, word crossbow in the subtitles. Thank you. I didn't catch it in the subtitles. They actually said the word in English. Okay, I didn't catch it at all. It's all the happy, happy. <laughs> so I mentioned a couple of parts and I asked you, but then I went to something else. Any other particular parts that you really liked about the movie? I want to know why on earth reenacting the degradation and persecution of witches is an annual event that the school ever agreed to participate in. Maybe it was the only way they could come back and strengthen the seal on the giant? Maybe there's a reason that they had that ceremony that way? Because it was a good way to um, not have anyone be suspicious of why these witches come to town every year? All they have to do is show up in the middle of the night and take care of it, and odds of being seen go way down. Yeah, except the giant glowing light would probably be emitted from that area and everyone in the neighborhood would be like, huh. Yeah, but there was even a sign by the stones explaining that Jennifer the Witch had sealed a great evil there. I don't know. I'm pretty sure the parade definitely has something to do with the statue. Definitely, because it ends with a ceremony at the stones. And I should say giant because technically the statue stones is part of the giant. I also like how, like, as usual, everything that was introduced gets involved in the final confrontation. The finale, I should say. Uh, like, we get the song introduced that she uses and the new characters and their skills and all that stuff. And we also get the spell from the very beginning of the movie. So everything we see ends up being incorporated. Right down to a use for mushrooms that is not poison. Yeah. There there she is again. One of my favorite characters in the last movie. Yeah. Susie is awesome, but this time it seemed like she was a little more mushroom focused. I remember her being more diverse in the first movie. Because the mushrooms were a recurring theme. Because that's even what she was looking at in the market when Lottie spoke up to Akko and when... Akko and Susie broke up for the 15th time. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe they decided to go with more of that theme because of the beginning of the movie. They wanted to keep with that theme. I like her a lot in the first movie. She's nice in this movie. But that new character, the thief, is just the like, I like her. I don't know why. I think it's because she's cool. Because we don't really have much to go on. 
um, even though they help out with the parade and they're part of the final battle and they're cheering the three on, we don't really get an integration of the two teams of three becoming a team of six. They're still very much separate. We got like the thin layer of what their personalities are. We haven't quite gotten a lot of information about them to get more about their personalities, what their motivations are for certain things. Like, why is he constantly trying to steal everything? I'm thinking the reason the girl is eating so much as well is because she's one of those magics or powers that relies on a lot of food. Like, Choji from Naruto is a good example of this. The reason he's eating all the time is because his family's specialization in chakra and ninjutsu happens to involve food and burning off a lot of calories and fat and stuff like that. So he needs all that extra girth to be able to use his powers. And she slightly demonstrated this in the episode by suddenly becoming very dense and launching poor Aiko across the... <laughs> Look at that brave witch! <laughs> I think that's the second time she's been launched like that. Well, considering her inability to ride a broom, flying slash falling through the air in an uncontrolled manner is kind of common. And going back to the magical rod... I thought it may have been, like, dead after the end of the movie and the climax and everything. So I'm like, well, you guys better keep track of your magic because batteries might run out at this point. Because I don't know how much juice the rod has left. I know. I'm like, okay, if the rod doesn't fail during the battle, you guys can't have much left for your after parade show off stuff. Because I was waiting for, like, as soon as it was over for, like, Diana to fall off her room. Yeah, I was waiting for everyone to just... <laughs> uh... Also, that mayor, he's the typical political figure in shows like this. Kind of slightly arrogant, kind of slightly sleazy. I, I mean, he wanted to move the stones out of the way to put up a statue of him because I believe he thought it would bring in more tourists. Well, he also wanted to redevelop the area to have like a big shopping center to bring in tourists. And also the statue of himself. Ah, uh. Also, I think he's trying to compensate for something. Just a little bit. Uh, so, any more nitpicks or negatives you want to go over? Uh, all sorts of nitpicks because... Okay, if those three are the classic problem students, why are you letting the three of them work together in the classroom in the first place? Mm. And if they're habitually troublesome, why don't you have someone supervising them during spells like this? And if together they're a problem... Have they tried separating them and that didn't turn out well? Because there's usually a bit of synergy that happens when you get the teams together. The three of them together can cause more mischief than the three of them separately. Yeah. Wondering, have they tried this? And did it go badly as well? And they're like, actually, they did less damage together. So let's just keep them. <laughs> <laughs> they kind of balanced each other out a little bit. Uh, but myself, I would like try to figure out some way to make better friends between her, Aiko, and Diana, because Diana seems to be a good foil for Aiko, because she can fix her problems. <laughs> like, you idiot. <laughs> Pretty much. So I'm like, why hasn't she, like, been assigned as school prefect or something? Yeah. Because, I mean, she was out patrolling, and that's how she saw the trouble in the first place at night. That was also how she saw Aiko, the uh, flight tower. And I don't know if it was inadvertent, which I'm pretty sure it was. She gave her the idea of like, wait a minute, this is a battery. I wonder. <laughs> oh, that was definitely inadvertent. If Mrs. Ursula had done it, then it would have been intentional. But Diana is, well, to continue using Harry Potter. <laughs> You're going for Malfoy, right? Yeah, basically a less uh, spiteful Malfoy. Yeah, someone with less anger and hostility towards everyone else because she's only that way by looks of it mostly towards Aiko. Because Aiko keeps doing stupid stuff so Diana's reactions are pretty well warranted. And also even though she's kind of aloof she's definitely not trying to get attention she just happens to be good at what she does because when the teacher praised her she was like yeah okay. She wasn't basking in the praise. Even though all the other students were suddenly sucking up to her, Diana, oh Diana, you're so wonderful. No, whatever, this is just what I do. 
So I like her because she offsets the, uh, she's not really the mean girl. She's just a counter to the high energy flaws everywhere main character. I, I think you would describe the main character as Genki or Genkai or? Yes, meaning full of energy, quite. Yes. She's also off the walls, crazy, has plots everywhere. Like Susie said, oh, another one of Aiko's plans. I think she even said like crazy or mm -hmm. out there plans. Also, I think the story was a little rushed because they were also trying to introduce these other characters. So I don't know if when they were writing this second movie, they had thoughts about this series in mind. Because I think they were trying to use this as kind of a springboard to introduce some characters they wanted to do in the series. Because I haven't seen the series myself. I'm interested in it. I just don't know if I'll have the time or if we'll have the time. You can watch things without me. It's just it requires both of us if we're going to do a recording. Because I heard your recordings when you were by yourself. That's why I joined. <laughs> I thought it was because I asked nicely. So anything else you want to go over before we start wrapping things up for this recording? I like Susie's dancing with the broom. The head to the left, oh, head yeah. to the right. How she disappears mm -hmm. too. That she was, disappears. That... that was just awesome. I'm like, that's really... That's nice. She's like the only one in that group that had actual talent with that. She wasn't doing the moves that she was being shown. She was just doing her own. And it was like, that's freaky. I like that. Let's use that one. <laughs> <laughs> that was less acrobatic, but still cool. And that reminds me. I like how at the end, when they were pulling everything together for the actual parade, she actually kind of just went, everyone, here's your specialty. Actually, you do it. And I'll just do what I can do. I would like to know what was in that letter. I know she probably apologized, but I want to know what she said and how she made up for the fact that it was a very selfish thing. She kind of pushed her plan on them. And how did she manage to reword it in such a way to bring everyone in and a shortcut for time and also because she's closer with Lottie and Susie. The three new girls only got one letter to share between the three of them. Lottie and Susie each got their own with special directions going, please look at this, please, 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 please. That suddenly reminded me of the library scene where you get these giant tall stacks of books. And these scenes even happen in scenes without magic, in, in shows without magic. And I'm like, how do you make a stack of books that high without a ladder? And why would you want to do that? Because the tables they show these on are usually big enough that you could make the stacks half that high. Also, when you're in a library and you're done with the book, if you're not going to put it back, put it in one of those carriage return carts. Yeah, and they also kind of made the stacks even on both sides, so usually it's actually, it starts out large on one side and transfers to the other. Yes, because you're showing the unread versus completed. But apparently she was just grabbing every book because we see her going back for even more books. Also, the music was nice. There were a couple of songs from the first movie back. Like mm. whenever the magic was being shown off in a certain way or in the final scenes, it was... I wonder if th this particular theme is actually either associated with Aiko or Chariot. Interesting to look up the credits sometime because they usually give the names of the songs. But I think it's kind of associated with both of them because we get Shiny Chariot's performance at the beginning of the first movie and that has some musical accompaniment and then elements of that were reused when she activated the Shiny Rod in the first movie. Even if it's not identical, it's similar so it may be the same melody just a different arrangement. This is a good last thing to end on. What did you think of the animation itself? Because I believe they had a bigger budget for this one. It was definitely different from the first one, which anytime you have shifts in animation, it can be a little offsetting. It was a little bit like Echo had some of the old school rubber hose physics, which I've never been a big fan of. Ah, well, I think that happens a lot with Studio Trigger, which is the studio that was behind this particular one. I don't know if they were behind the first one, because I remember it being an independent thing that they did on their own. Maybe it's some people from Studio Trigger and then Studio Trigger brought them back in the fold after the first one was a big hit. But that particular studio likes to use that exaggeration and rubber hose physics to really show the impact of a scene. Like they use proportions a lot and they stretch them and make things larger to give emphasis. Like 
the one scene where Diana gets larger compared to Aiko is to show her presence and how big she's being in that scene compared to Aiko. But that's not rubber hose, and that's specifically kind of an animation turnoff for me. Nah. Any particular s scenes you can bring up where the rubber hosing really happened? Because right now I'm only thinking of particular action scenes and stuff like that. Basically anything with Aiko. Because ah. the physics on her body, especially when falling or having any sort of crazy meltdown moment. Hmm. Though it's not as fully traditional rubber hose as old school animation. It still has that exaggerated element and it's very much noticeable when there's only one character that acts like that so it kind of separates her more from the rest of the cast which is also kind of a typical sign of this is the anime protagonist because they're different from everyone else even the way they're drawn <laughs> i was thinking about a little bit about the way they draw susie and how she was like whoop and her arm like kind of comes out and she has that kind of classic witch about her. Yeah, she has a very classic tightly pulled in profile and the very stealthy, smooth type movements. You know, very traditional to animated vampires, etc. We find out later in this series that Susie is actually a vampire. Funny, but I very much doubt it. We later find out that her idol is Morticia Adams. I have given hints in the past in other animes that certain characters are either inspired by or actually related to. I'm looking at you, Project Geiko and Superman. <laughs> <laughs> that was a fun movie. It's been forever since I've seen it. But moving back to this movie, any more thoughts or should we wrap things up? I thought we were wrapping things up because, you know, you already had a sketch. So all you're having to do this time is color. <laughs> And appropriate enough, it's of Ego falling. Like I said, that seems to be a constant. This has been our thoughts on Little Witch Academia, The Enchanted Parade. Ah, I see we have some after credit people here. I can see you are interested only in the exceptionally rare. That's not us. We're kind of common. <laughs> but hey, you're here. So, spiel? Lux draws lots of stuff. Check out his DeviantArt, Tumblr, Twitter, Mastodon, Reddit, Google+, Facebook. He keeps finding places. I do! I do! Uh, enjoy the zaniness that is our commentary. We've been at this YouTube thing for a while. There are tons of videos to watch, like, share, comment on, rewatch, subscribe. If you're not subscribed, I know a lot of you are. Thank you. Really enjoy Lux's art and want some of your own? Well, you know, I, I guess that is a thing. <laughs> he has a commission link. You can check it for pricing and availability. And you just have some spare change you want to throw our way? Uh, we also take direct donations through Patreon and Coffee. Patreon starts at a dollar with monthly sketches and voting rights. Yes, you can donate more. Thank you. And coffee works in increments of three. No ongoing commitment there. Thank you to everyone who watches, everyone who is subscribed, everyone who comments and supports this channel and our efforts in any ways, both financially and non-financially. We truly appreciate it. Thank you.